everyone, my name is Alicia Belarus with Medical Device Academy, and today we're going to discuss the U.S. FDA's pre-market submission process for medical devices. If you're a domestic startup company with an idea you want to develop, or an already established manufacturer looking to expand into the U.S. market, you're not going to want to miss today's video. To start with, we have to clarify medical devices. Because the FDA also oversees drugs, biologics, biosimilars, and combination devices, which are both devices and drugs in the same configuration. Like an insulin injection pen, in the regulatory field of medical devices, you will also notice a separation of devices from in vitro diagnostic devices. For this presentation, we're referring to non-IVD medical devices. Today we are going to cover when you need a pre-market submission, a 510K, including traditional, abbreviated, and special 510Ks, de novos, and PMA. We will also be showing a roadmap at the end. Back in 1976, the medical device amendments were added to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. Although the FDA was active long before that, these amendments set the stage for providing regulatory pathways for medical devices to be introduced into the U.S. market. They also introduced many new acronyms that you may recognize today. In the medical device industry, this includes IDE, PMA, and 510K. That we will discuss later. In addition to adding ways for devices to come to the market, the FDA was also given the authority to ban devices from the market as well. As a general rule of thumb, if you want to sell your medical device legally in the United States, you need regulatory approval, clearance, or at least registration in order to do so. This is done to guarantee reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness in the device. Something that couldn't be controlled if patients had to source and provide their own pacemakers off the Facebook marketplace. Who knows what you would receive instead of a pacemaker, and that's not something you want taken inside your body. FDA approved is a bit of a controversial term. The FDA does approve some devices, but this term has been co-opted for marketing purposes to imply things that the FDA does not themselves explicitly endorse. One example is the FDA regulates tobacco, but Skoll doesn't have an FDA approved tin of dip or a pack of cigarettes. Imagine if there was, what kind of world would we live in then? Now, in general, the FDA will approve higher risk devices. When we discuss PMAs, you will see that the entire application is focused on gaining the FDA's approval before bringing that device to market. 510Ks get their name because they are the type of pre-market notification that are outlined within Section 510K of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This section requires device manufacturers to register and notify the FDA that they intend to market a medical device in the United States. The purpose of a 510K is for the FDA to determine whether a new device in question is substantially equivalent in efficiency and safety to a device that is already on the market. This could be a device that you already manufacture or simply an already on the market device. New is a subjective term in this context. New refers to devices that are being introduced onto the market or commercial distribution for the first time. It also refers to devices that are being reintroduced to the market after significant changes or modifications that could change the safety or effectiveness of the device. Significant changes is another subjective term. All changes made to a device must be documented, but some changes require that device to go through the 510K process again for clearance. Small changes that do not affect the safety or performance can be addressed in documenting the rationale for that claim in a letter to file. 
changes that do or could affect safety or performance that may require a new 510K include design of the device, change in materials slash chemical composition, source of energy, manufacturing process, or the intended use. The process of a 510K can be expensive and all types of 510Ks cost the same amount. However, it is important to note that there is a substantial difference in price for small businesses. Instead of paying the standard user fee of $12,745, a small business will instead pay $3,186. So if you qualify, which most of our clients do because we specialize in helping startups navigate this process, it is well worth registering with the FDA as a small business if you can. Emphasis, if you can. All 510Ks compare a device in question against a legally marketed predicate device. However, different types of 510K applications can be used in different circumstances. First is the traditional, which has the tactical benefit of being acceptable in all 510K situations. So when in doubt, a traditional 510K is always an option. Special 510Ks are optional, and a traditional 510K could be used instead. The Special 510K is an optional regulatory pathway for manufacturers to submit when they already have a legally marketed device and the device in question is a modified version of the already marketed device. This type of 510K is also sometimes referred to as a catch-up 510K. No, not like the condiment, like catch-up. And used after a series of letter to file changes cumulatively add up to a substantial enough changes from the original device in the new 510k. And on to the final type of 510k, we have the abbreviated 510k. The abbreviated 510k relies heavily on the use of and compliance with guidance documents special controls, and voluntary consensus standards. They are abbreviated and, in some circumstances, certain test data may not be needed within this type of 510K. However, there is a downside, and that is that these 510Ks are not always appropriate, and the FDA can decide to require that you convert an abbreviated 510K into a traditional 510K. And that's extra work nobody wants to do. However, if that happens, the review period does not change for that conversion period. And it is based off the receipt date of the original abbreviated 510K. So if you have to convert an abbreviated 510K, it generally means you need to perform an additional data collection as well. The FDA maintains a database of the voluntary consensus standards that they receive for reference. Here's an example. If you happen to be developing a cardiovascular related medical device, the FDA recognizes AAMI TIR 42 2021 evaluation of the particulates associated with vascular medical devices published by the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, and it may be an applicable standard. De novo means roughly new or from the beginning or a new. To summarize a de novo submission to the FDA is used when there is no predicate device in which to use established substantial equivalency. However, you shouldn't submit a de novo if you do not have to, as the user fees are so much higher than those for a 510k submission. Pre-market approval applications are much different than 510k and de novo submissions. 
This type of submission is used for the highest risk devices out there. Ones that are used to support or sustain life. Because they are high risk devices, the FDA has determined that general and special controls that are used for other devices are enough to ensure that the safety and effectiveness of the device. Because PMAs are for such high risk devices, the review process is much, much, much more in depth than something like a special 510K. Because of this review process, it is much more involved. It is also much more expensive. Surprise, surprise. Even a small business pricing for this review is nearly $100,000, and that's no mere pocket change. All right, so the first step on this roadmap is that the Document Control Center receives the 510K submission. They also assign the submission a K number. That K number will be used to identify your application. Next, the DDC double checks two verification tests. First is, has the proper user fee been received? Then, has a valid e-copy submission or equivalent been received? If the submission passes those verification checks, then you will receive an acknowledgement letter by email. If not, you will instead receive a hold letter. After the DDC sends you the acknowledgement letter, they will send you your submission to the appropriate FDA office and begin acceptance review. Once your application is received by the appropriate office, a lead reviewer will be assigned to your submission. The lead review will review your submission to verify that it meets the minimum administrative rec requirements to move forward in the review process. If your submission passes this review, it will move to the substantive review process. Otherwise, you'll have to receive a refusal to accept or RTA notification. And really, nobody wants that. The substantive review is a comprehensive evaluation of the content of your submission. The substantive review can have multiple parts. One part may be an interactive review where the lead reviewer has determined that there are deficiencies in the submission, but they can be resolved during the review period and a hold is not necessary. Or you could also receive an AI request which stands for additional information. This means that the reviewer has determined more information is needed in order to finish the review process. An AI request means that the review of your submission is placed on hold and you are given a list of information that the FDA needs in order to finish the review process. When the FDA finishes a review, you will receive a decision letter that either determines your device is substantially equivalent to the predicate or not substantially equivalent. These terms are often referred to as SE or NSE determinations. Devices that are decided to be SE are now officially cleared for market. The FDA tries to complete this process within 100 calendar days from the DCC acknowledgement letter to the decision letter, however, holds. The AI requests or other circumstances can affect the actual time of the review. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you liked what you saw, please hit the subscribe button. There will be plenty more on the way. If you want more now, please visit our website or you can check out our Facebook page. We hope to hear from you soon. Bye!